a barely legible font with way too many spikes and guitars that sound like an airplane engine played through a broken pair of headphones can only mean one thing. This is going to get a bit metal. Hello friends, Anderson here. Today I would like to take you on a journey into the twilight, into the fractured dominion in the world of Uzrun. The setting of a game like a metal album cover, specifically one like this, probably. Disciples of Bone and Shadow. Now before we start, please do me a favor and like the video, comment, subscribe to the channel if you feel like getting more regular content from me, because that is the kind of thing that you do when you're on YouTube, saying this kind of stuff. Also allow me to alert you to the fact that we now have a community tab that I will use to broadcast information about releases and schedules and things like that. Things like, for instance, Worlds Without Number will continue next week as we wrap up. Things like that. But enough of that and on we go. In today's video I'd like to give you a quick rundown leaf through of parts of the book and get to and through the character creation process because I would like to play this game for a while. And as a first point of entry here's what you need to play the game. You'd ideally need the game and I always find it handy to print myself out the character sheet. There is also a tracking sheet for scenes and characters and story arcs because this has a distinct narrative component to it and something a bit special which is a tracking sheet for plants because this game also has a very interesting alchemy component. We need some square graph paper for the more detailed crawling through dungeons and a bit of hex paper for the crawling of the overworld or stalking, slouching, whatever your preferred mode of posture is. Which segues a little bit into the vibe, the theme and the background of the game. Without going too much into detail, let me just share some of the art with you to give you a bit of an idea, because I found that quite evocative. Here's a little glimpse of Madari, a city, or rather the city, the pretty much only civilized spot on the main set piece of this game, which is the White Teeth Peninsula. Behold the obelisk and some of the, well, wildlife, I guess, or rather the unlife that is stalking this place. And a map to give you a better idea of what we're dealing with. So that is the setting, the White Teeth Peninsula. Other parts of the world are mentioned, but the expectation is that you play in the White Teeth Peninsula. And as the set pieces, the art style, and the broad strokes of the setting indicate, it is a dark setting, but not dark in the sense, at least to my understanding, that is the grimdarkish version that we get a little bit too much perhaps of these days, which occasionally confuses nihilism for realism. This is more the Howard Conan came hither kind of darkness that is a bit more over the top. And it has tyrannical wizards striving for power, setting themselves up by making deals with the primordial ones and dominating parts of the countryside and maybe that's even a goal for our character because you're not exactly playing necessarily the good guy here and there may even be no such thing as the good guys in a place like the White Teeth Peninsula, really. So the vibe is definitely bent towards my liking. <laughs> And the game itself is one that supports and has baked in the solo play angle, which is why we're going to be covering it. Let's give it a quick look. We start off with a short story that is quite evocative as well and gives us a pretty good idea of the general type of person that this game's stories will generally revolve around, as well as how deadly the world and the exploration of the sites is and then it by way of a rather nice piece of art 
transitions into the basic concept of the game, explaining to you the type of dice you'll be using, which is generally the ten-sided ones, and the paper grids and all of that. We have character creation next, which is quite convenient because that is what we are going to try and do today. Character creation is relatively straightforward. We have a set of attributes. I'll show you the character sheet briefly. Strength, Dexterity, Constitution, Will, Intelligence, Charisma. So those would generally mean something to you if you've played this type of game before and they are pretty much what's on the tin. And we have a number of skills, active skills that also require point distribution. We start at level one. We start with a max corruption of 10 and that is also a mechanic here that is quite closely tied to parts of the magic system and the world in general because magic corrupts in this setting, at least most kinds of magics, which is also where these tyrants come in because they are ultimately deeply corrupted through their quest for power and they are our main driving force behind our antagonists. They are our main antagonists in its own way, even though we will not exactly be going up against one of them at level one. But they might also end up being our role models because, you know, character goals and such. Perhaps we want to be corrupted up to a point because if we get too corrupted, we lose control of a character. We start with a 10 score in every attribute and a bunch of free points to allocate, 20 to be exact. And we get to spend 250 points among these skills here with the caveat that for a starting character, none of them can be higher than 50. We also start with currency, 200 jets, a healing tincture and 10 rations, plus our weapon of choice. Now before we go into the attribute distribution, I'd like to show you the archetypes quickly. We have a set of starting archetypes that we can build towards. The idea here is that they synergize in a way and that they give you a kind of direction to go into and that there are advanced archetypes that you can eventually build up on or towards and they come with some unique skills as well that you can attain by meeting the qualifications for said archetype. You're not restricted or limited to a certain amount of archetypes, you can in a way catch them all. So one of the goals of the game can also be to acquire all the unique skills that come through the archetypes. So our starting archetypes are the Acolyte, the Brawler, the Burglar, the Hunter or the Vitalist, which is a, a healer type person. I think the rest rather speak for themselves. It gives us an idea of what the main strength is going to be just by the name alone. And one of the specifics of these archetypes is that the ability scores to start them off on have to be met exactly. So our point distribution, if we want to say play an acolyte, has to take into account that we take our base 10 and then we add 4 to constitution, 6 to willpower and 5 to charisma and then we meet the requirements. And since I would like to start as an acolyte, that's exactly what I'm going to do. An acolyte is someone who has seen the power of the tyrants and wants it for their own. They have stumbled upon secret knowledge and started a path towards ascension or madness. Yep, that's uh, the kind of character I'd like to play. This also raises our max corruption to 11. And it gives us the daily use one of the spell Shadow Flames. Now, that is 15 of our 20 points already gone and I will pump the rest into intelligence because I would like for our person here to be an intelligent person who makes use of their brain. Of course with a strength of 10 it might also end up happening that the zombies in this world make use of our brain but we'll see about that. Now the fact that we have skills with a max rank of 50 for the start of character creation and that we use a die 10 based system would already suggest that we are dealing with a percentage based skill resolution system which is in fact what we're dealing with. So if we want to increase our chances to succeed we increase the rank of the skill 
that we'd like to succeed in. And since I want to benefit from one of the strengths of this game and its system, I will put alchemy as high as I can, because I really want to play around with that alchemy system. Alchemy, you may be able to notice here, also does not come with any sort of associated thingy in brackets, which gives us the starting value, usually based either on a flat number or a, a combination of stat scores or a stat score with a multiplier. Alchemy does not herb lore, which we need to identify various plants, doesn't either. Unfortunately, as an alchemist, we'd like to be able to identify various plants and we also have to pump this up to the max that we are currently allowed to. That is 100 of 250 already gone. I would also like to reflect our quest for power in a certain affinity to knowledge, which means our friend here is going to be somewhat knowledgeable in traditional lore, which starts with a base stat of 20, and this skill allows a character to know about a place's history and customs and have a general understanding of Uzrun's history, since if we are going to delve around some ancient ruins in pursuit of our next step up the rung of power or madness, we will need to know where to go and look. I will give this 20 of our points, putting it up to 40. And since we would like to have some ability to defend ourselves, I will also take ranged weapons, which the base score of is dexterity times two. That gives us a 20, and I'll give it another 20 to bump it up to 40. And I think that's going to be a sling. However, since we're not going to be very good at fighting, we should probably be good at two other things, which is talking our way out of sticky situations and not being seen. I will give 30 points to sneaking. The base score is dexterity times two, which is 20, since our dexterity is 10. And the 30 to put it up to 50, because we will just be creeping around trying not to be seen. Another 30 go into persuasion, putting that up to 45, because the base score is charisma. And another 30 in forbidden lore, which again doesn't have a starting value, and I don't want to max it out, because I think we should also somewhat reflect that our character is still at the very beginning of their journey to forbidden power. But let's have a quick look at the description here. Knowledge of the primordial ones, their servants and their powers. Sometimes you need to understand the motivations and machinations of the sunken powers to be able to resist them or become one with them. That doesn't leave too many points. I will put 10 into literacy, putting that up to 25 because the base score is int, which is 15. I would read this as we have pursued a lot of verbally transmitted lore, but we are now about to also try and make sense of the scrolls and books and tomes, but we're not very good at it. We are intelligent, but we are not necessarily yet a learned person, at least in a literary sense. And the last 10 I will put into dodge, which is dexterity times two. So we have 30 dodge. And what this tells as a story, this person here on paper looks woefully inequipped to face <laughs> this particular world, which is probably true. And I'm rather curious how this is gonna go. I think we might end up pursuing adventures initially in the safety of some sort of settlement and using our persuasiveness and our overall ability to be somewhat of a scholarly type to insinuate ourselves in somebody's business and perhaps then if we want to venture forth ruin exploring and things like that we have to bring some hired help somebody who can find a way, orient themselves through the wilds, somebody who can hold a shield and a sword in front of us so we can stand in the back and once a day cast a little spell 
and the other times throw some rocks at them. Like a classic old school level one wizardly type, squishy as hell, not really capable of doing much, but full of potential. Let's fill out the rest of the skills as the minimum scores dictate. So we have some scores in pretty much all of this, but it is not a pretty picture. Now, next step in character creation is to choose character flaws or a character flaw, which brings us a bit closer to the personality of this particular lady or gentleman. And I think a picture already emerges of a certain type, at least, combined through the skills. And now maybe we get a bit of a more sharp view on what kind of an actual persona we're dealing with. A character flaw comes in three levels of severity and impact. As the rules stated, basically from just a quirk to a full-blown problem. We choose a character flaw and only one character flaw during character creation and we choose a severity from one to three and the level we choose gives us enhancement points which we can spend on useful abilities that are part of our background. I think I would like to use the two rank of a flaw. We have absent-minded, bad-tempered, coward, stubborn, impulsive and lazy. Coward seems not unlikely. Let's see what the two is. You freeze up, unable to act or say much. That seems almost like for somebody who wants to talk their way out of sticky situations. A bit of a hindrance. I mean, they are supposed to be hindrances and not a bit of a hindrance at level two, but rather quite a full-blown one. But perhaps we find something more appropriate. Absent-minded, you misplace or forget important things like for example securing your horse, saddle or check your boots for thorn beetles every morning. That is actually, that could be interesting if we have like a late blooming traveler, like some old man, scholar kind of fellow who had some awakening incident, finding maybe some, maybe it was like a miner for the entirety of his life and then found like an old stone tablet and the depictions coming to life, burning themselves into his somewhat forgetful brain. And even though at the time he couldn't read, he understood what they were trying to tell him. And he dropped the pickaxe, stalked out of the mine and became some kind of wandering alchemist on a quest for ultimate power. That could be our character. Stubbornness would also fit, I think. But I think the, the social ostracism risk is, is not very palatable to me. The way I envision this character is a bit like uh, risking the wrath of a community would be pretty much the last thing he'd be willing to do since he is very much dependent on others to survive. So let's maybe really go with the absent-minded on severity 2. The enhancement points we can spend either on advanced skills or on passive skills. So we can give ourselves certain passive improvements or we can be able to already do some advanced stuff here. Let's have a quick screen. We could go for blood magic, that's an interesting one. Starting with a score of will times two, which is not terrible, it's our highest score. By sacrificing one HP to the sunken powers, a blood mage may double the effectiveness of any spell. So we can make this particular spell that we can do once a day very, very oomph, provided it actually benefits from it. <laughs> I guess if it does damage, then it's very likely going to benefit from it. Disarm traps, haggling, lockpicking. Hmm. I think I already spot something that will be very, very useful for our character, which is Charismatic, which costs one enhancement points and gives us pretty much advantage in D&D terms on uh, persuasion tests. We can use the best of two roles that is essential for our survival and our early game to persuade others to do what is useful for us. 
Intimidation would also be interesting. We can also be, well, pretty much bluffing that we are a mighty alchemist and spellcaster and by furrowing our old man brow to intimidate other people. Seduction, I'm not sure. <laughs> I I'm not sure I want to play that. Um, stealthy, also interesting, another reroll, but two rerolls I think is a bit boring. Or magic resistance could also be interesting, but it's, um, I think we're gonna go with intimidation because that's just what we're building towards. So we have our character be very able to utilize persuasiveness. Now, next up, we have advantages and disadvantages, which also helps us understand a little bit about our character's past and background. We roll this with a die 20. So while it is a percentage and D100 based system, we also need the 20 sided die to make some of the rolls on the tables at least. Five traveled okay so maybe you belong to a nomadic clan or you were raised in a merchant caravan but regardless of the reason you've always moved around and have an understanding of how things work pretty quickly when you arrive at a new place factions rumors trends you absorb them all in a matter of hours i think that fits incredibly well with the character we've built here so we note down traveled and now for the disadvantage Nine, indebted. You owe a large sum to a powerful merchant who will not let you escape that easily. If you try to avoid paying it, he will send his goons after you. He is willing to allow you to repay him with work though. There's plenty of dirty work available for the desperate in the peninsula. So that is also, I think, kind of an interesting one because it gives us almost like a hook for our first adventure since we are expecting to be somewhat civilization-based in a town or a village or, or, or larger or like almost city, maybe not in the capital right away. And we had to borrow this money maybe to buy a certain scroll that we just had to have or because something went really awry and we indebted ourselves just to survive. And of course that merchant will expect us to do things and that'll get us in trouble but we'll also try to use that to weasel some of his henchmen out of the merchant because ah oh, what good am i to you that send a brute with me if you send me out into the wilderness something like this and i think i will write down indebted to merchant slash criminal because that's some kind of black marketeer relic trader who we fell in with and on the wrong side of. Now, where in the White Teeth Peninsula did we come from? That is a die 10 roll. Eight, Death Rot Marsh. That sounds absolutely lovely. I actually just flipped it on there first try. Difficult, dangerous terrain, deadly and bizarre fauna and flora, home to the precious shelvin wood. Aha. This wood is harvested from giant trees that can only be found in the heart of Death Roth. Death Roth Marsh and its incredible properties, strong as iron, fireproof and light, make it extremely valuable to armies all across the fractured dominion. Right, because this is also more of a wood and bone and leather kind of fantasy and not exactly steel and plate and armor and things like that. So we're from a boggy, verminous, horrible area where people harvest a certain kind of wood. That means we're probably not a miner. We were more of a forester until in our old age, the revelation struck us and we set out and we became well-traveled. And now we are an accomplished herbalist alchemist indebted to a merchant on the quest for forbidden lore and power and immortality. That's a character. I like it. Now, since it's going to be quite a focus for our character, just one quick overview of alchemy. One of the specifics that also brings into play this here sheet is that we can discover plant effects and what combined with which produces what other. So every time we encounter a new plant, we determine it's what combination of brews makes which effect and 
make a note of it, especially where we found the plant. So not every plant can be found everywhere. So during our world exploration, we note, do we find it overground, underground, interior, exterior? So we need to also in some cases be in specific areas to find certain plants. Now lastly, we need a name that somewhat fits the theme. I've had a look at some of the other names in this setting and I will go with a name that I sometimes use for characters of mine and that name is Malkali. So this is Malkali, the crotchety old herbalist who wants to become a tyrant. And that is scratching the surface of some of this. I realize we haven't gone into the systems at all because that is what we'd like to do once we actually play the game. It is definitely much easier to show than to tell. We haven't gotten much into the background of the world, which is also something we'd like to discover during play a bit more of. And all in all, there is definitely a lot more under the hood and going on here system-wise and in terms of narrative engine. So we will look at all of that once we actually play the game. For now, we have a way to play the game. We have Malkali, who can embark on his first adventure to try and get himself out of his debt and who should probably not be picking many fights unless he's managed to persuade somebody to come along and function as a bodyguard. So very curious how this is going to go. Thank you very much for watching. I'll catch you next time and bye for now.